I finally met the love of my life. So this is what true love feels like. I finally got my love story. I waited my whole life and finally I have real love. You hear this or you read this and it feels awful. You may even be glad the narcissistic relationship's over, but it still feels bad because you once heard those same things from them. The classical narcissistic fairy tale starts with idealization and then moves on to devaluation and then discarding. Everyone thinks it won't happen to them and yet, without exception, the story goes down the same way every time. To feel thrown away by another person is an awful experience, but yet it is sort of a universal part of the narcissistic relationship. So let's start by taking a look at the narcissistic relationship cycle. In most cases, not all, not all by any means, but many of most, the idealization often takes the form of love bombing which is another video in this series. So love bombing or idealization lasts just long enough to get you stuck in this relationship dynamic. Just when you exhale and believe in the fairy tale, then bam, that's when the devaluation phase starts. Devaluation can start slow. It's when the little criticisms begin, when you start experiencing the contempt, when the gifts and the big nights out go away, when the narcissist's phone becomes much more interesting than you sitting in front of them, and when the sideways comments like, I don't know, like, are you really going to wear that? And other comments of that ilk start to creep into the relationship. It can be a real time of intense confusion in the relationship because you can't figure out when the love bombing ended and when the contempt began. All you know is it's though the weather changed. It went from being very warm to very cold kind of quickly. The devaluing phase tends to happen just as you start to feel more settled into the relationship as a real relationship. You may have actually been resisting the relationship for a while, and you might have even have been savvy enough to think, oh, this love bombing is a little bit too good to be true. I'm not gonna be played. And then just when you settled in, when you felt like it was a real and whole relationship, that is when the devaluation begins. The reason for this sort of shift it's a bit nuanced, but it largely happens because at the deepest deep, a narcissist's self-loathing is actually so deep and so unprocessed that just as someone does see the good in them, it's as though it activates their self-contempt, which they then project onto you and then voila, devaluation. It's as though they project their devaluation of themselves onto you. Now, devaluation can last for months, years, and even decades. It becomes, before you know it, sort of a new normal. Your life tends to be punctuated by insults and by invalidation. The discard is just what it sounds like. Discarding is honestly like throwing out the trash. It's like they're done with you. Now, sometimes discarding never really truly happens. You may just kind of get stuck in the purgatory of devaluation forever. But discarding happens when they cast you aside. And it, it, this is almost like discarding is like, it can be really cold and you can actually have a narcissistic relationship that keeps happening even when you've been discarded. So for example, your narcissist may have an affair, an extramarital affair or just cheat on you. And so you were in essence discarded but you still stay in the relationship. Or they may take a job or take advantage of an opportunity that doesn't take you into consideration, 
So either you have to leave your life behind to join them or be left behind. So they're just kind of doing what works for them. The discarding is often motivated for the narcissist from a place of both contempt and of boredom. Basically, your narcissistic supply has become quite stale. And narcissists tend to be very novelty seeking. So it all depends on your story. No matter what, it feels awful to be discarded from a relationship that you actually believe that you're in. Many narcissists expect you often to do the dirty work and end the relationship so they can turn around and say, oh, she was the one who left me. He was the one who filed for divorce. She moved out and walked out on me and the kids. Oh, he walked away from his family. When that happens, they get to look good to the world. And since the narcissist is often going to turn around and tell the world a false story, then you look like the one who is unfeeling or unkind or willing to walk away from something which doesn't feel good. Now, the mistakes that people most often make during the devaluation and the discarding phase is to ask that killer question, why? During the devaluation phase, they're going to gaslight you and deny that they are devaluing you. And in fact, they may turn around and call you paranoid or hypersensitive or crazy. Now, during the discarding phase, if you try to make them accountable for their behavior, again, you're going to run into more gaslighting. Now, people want to make sense of this process. So asking why is understandable, but there's really no sense to be made of it because the narcissist isn't going to cop to it. The narcissist isn't going to turn around and say, yeah, I'm not capable of making healthy attachments and I'm deeply insecure and I have contempt for intimacy. So I am actually, yeah, I'm rejecting you and I'm treating you badly to see and test my hypothesis that you will observe my insecurity and that you will leave me and my fantasy is that's the case and then let's see if that comes true. Now, they are not going to say that to you, even though that's the dynamic that's likely unfolding. So asking them for an explanation is likely to bring more harm than good because they themselves aren't in touch with what's happening. Now, the devaluing and discarding cycles happen in families as well. In general, if you aren't just blindly going along with a narcissist agenda, then they often think that you are against them. And in a family, this can happen when you just don't go along with the program, with what the narcissistic parent or sibling or aunt or grandparent want. Your family members the, the family members will find out that if you, or they learn that if you appease the narcissistic family member, then you will be able to keep them calm and stay in their good graces. And this can be particularly profound if the narcissist has some kind of power. So for example, the money that they may use to control family members. So if you do lay down some real boundaries, that's when often in a family, the devaluation and discarding cycle can begin. Now for scapegoats in a family system, the discard and devaluation cycle is an eternal part of the scapegoat's role in the family system. They're constantly being devalued, constantly being devalued. And if the scapegoat tries to set a boundary, boom, they'll be discarded. Now devaluing and discarding can also absolutely take place in workplace settings. And in those cases, it's in which narcissistic bosses and narcissistic managers and leaders devalue the people that they think aren't their team players. Basically, these are the people who are not the yes men or the yes women. And then ultimately, they may make life so miserable for the people who don't just sign on with whatever twisted agenda they have that those people actually end up leaving or may get fired. Now, the devaluation and discarding cycle is sadly enough often followed by hoovering. That's why it's a dysfunctional cycle. Some people get so disgusted by the discarding cycle that they do ultimately leave.
but it's not unusual for that insecure narcissist who wants to keep control to try to hoover them back. Now, if you fall for it and allow yourself to be sucked in, that whole cycle is gonna begin again. Idealization, devaluation, and discarding. It's just sort of this eternal cycle that's really only gonna end if you're the one who's gonna be courageous enough to break it. And it can really be quite addictive. Lots of people confuse the excitement of hoovering and idealization with love. It's really not. It's abuse. And therapy becomes a key tool to at least start thinking about how to end the confusion and the conflation that love and abusive relationship cycles are the same thing. Now, narcissists devalue and discard for many of the reasons mentioned, but also because they devalue intimacy and because they have very limited empathy. They don't really care how these cycles are hurting you or impacting you. They just do it without thinking. And in some ways, the chaos, it feels comfortable for them. They don't have any regard for how it hurts you, but they do kind of like the excitement and the roller coaster nature of this cycle. Now, these toxic cycles take a tremendous toll on the people who get stuck in them. Basically, this turns relationships into roller coasters and almost like addictive cycles. And these can often perpetuate early childhood patterns you may have had around rejection. In some ways, these toxic cycles keep the relationship exciting for the narcissist. And it's very easy to get sucked into their vortex and cycle. And for some people, this cycle, strangely enough, becomes sort of a reenactment of trying to win over their unwinnable parent in childhood. It almost feels familiar to be rejected, and it can feel exciting when you are hoovered back in and idealized for a minute. And in that moment, you're almost taken back to childhood where you feel like, oh, I've won that parent over. But then when the devaluing and discard cycles happen, and it's inevitable that they will, Sadly, those cycles feel familiar too. And your ancient script of feeling like you're not enough gets activated again. Now, some people allow these devaluation and discarding cycles to happen because they'll often buy into the narcissist narrative about how difficult their lives were. And, and the narcissist's lives may very well have been quite difficult. The narcissist will often share a story about having never seen love when they were growing up and that it was so terrible for them. And you endure the narcissist cycle because you believe it's the loving thing to do, that maybe you're going to correct it for the narcissist. And it's not. Allowing yourself to be harmed in the name of love isn't love. Their tale of woe or abuse or trauma, it may be very, very true. They may have actually had a very rough childhood, and it is, you're sorry about that. But it's not your responsibility. It's not your responsibility. You can't change their history. And remaining there as an object that at times they value but more often reject is not only you know, not doing the narcissist any favors, it's taking a tremendous toll on your mental and physical health. There are no winners here. Now, being discarded is an awful feeling. It can raise tremendous triggers around abandonment and rejection. And lots of people will fight for the relationship at that point. They want to maintain that fantasy of the happy relationship or the happy family. The fact is, in some ways, we are really stubborn creatures, we human beings, and we fight for those things we can't have. We get stuck on the things we can't have. And things often become much more interesting when they're slipping away or we're just not allowed to have them. We're all the kids who want the thing in the cookie jar. And don't fall for that trick. If you have been devalued and then you're being discarded, receive it, believe it or not, as a gift. I know that sounds paradoxical. But it's a chance to get away from a relationship that is likely making you sick. But to do that, you have to value yourself first. And that requires a deeper dive into where those scripts about self-devaluation come from and flipping yourself over into a space of self-compassion. Now, keep in mind that self-compassion is like 
kryptonite against the charms of the narcissist. Once you have self-compassion, honestly, the narcissist is rendered powerless and you can finally walk away. It's interesting to think that in a discard and a devalue cycle that you could actually get that kind of power. You often feel like you're stuck at the whims of the narcissist when they will devalue you, when they will discard you, whether that's a partner, family member, or even a boss. But the fact of the matter is, ultimately, believe it or not, in these cycles, you have a lot more power than you think in the form of self-compassion. Self-compassion not only allows you to say, yeah, no, I'm not doing this cycle. I see what it is. It's not good for me. And allow you, allow you, to, step, allow you to step away. But self-compassion also allows you to feel compassion for the other. And as difficult and challenging as these narcissistic relationships are, as I said, Many times, narcissistic individuals have had very difficult backstories. In fact, it's what explains a lot of their personality and why it's organized the way it is. There is no need for you to engage in those kinds of toxic cycles. You don't have to de devalue and discard. From a place of self-compassion, you can also let them go from a place of compassion. And in your heart, hope that maybe they can go and get the help they need to grow into a healthier future. However, that's not your job. Self-preservation is a right. And if you're going to preserve yourself in these cycles, you've got to exercise that right and break the devaluation and discard cycle. Thank you again for tuning in. I hope this video helped you understand the theme, the terms, devaluation, and more importantly, discarding, which are very much a part of the narcissistic relationship cycle. So let's set the tone. You're in a relationship with a narcissistic person. The relationship ends. Very quickly, or even within a few months, they enter a new relationship. Well, of course, they're narcissistic, so they can't not be noisy about it. So it's all, I finally met the love of my life. So this is what true love feels like. I finally got my love story. I waited my whole life. And finally, I have real love. You hear this or you read this and it feels awful. You may even be glad the narcissistic relationship's over, but it still feels bad because you once heard those same things from them. So that leaves you in a position of, was it never real with me? Or even worse for some survivors, what does this new person have that I don't? Many people will say that these public proclamations of once in a lifetime love story that they see their narcissistic ex doing can really ping on that whole idea of feeling not enough. Intellectually, you may even think, great, now they're your problem, new person, and not mine. But there's something about having your history with someone invalidated. The disconnect can feel unsettling. Obviously, there are layers of this. If you still had hope for the relationship or still cared, then this, when this happens, it can be utter devastation. If you are done and somewhat indifferent, but have, for example, children together and your co-parented children are having to see this, it can kind of be awful to have to walk children through this and to accept that your narcissistic ex and co-parent is so unempathic that they wouldn't care about harming their children, who of course the narcissist believes their children should be so happy for them that who cares if the children are a little unsettled by their parents' brand new shiny love story and their makeout pictures on social media. And if you are done and indifferent, well, then that's probably the best and the easiest. But after a while, the sort of wincing faces of people that feel bad for you, it may get on your nerves. Again, the reason they do this has nothing to do with you and it has everything to do with the narcissistic incapacity for intimacy. Their intimacy is shallow, is focused solely on what it does for them, what it gets them. And so every new love story filled with excitement and fresh new supply, it's their new great love story. So when this feels just awful because it is unjust is when they roll into a relationship that gives them the supply that they want. 
the new partner, I don't know, maybe has lots of money or is much younger or has a nice house or something. Because no matter how much you genuinely love them, and you did, the idea that they could trade it all in, trade a life you made with them for the thing that ticks the boxes better for their validation, it's absolutely devastating. And again, like I said, for survivors, it plays into an I am not enough mindset that often even predated the relationship. So what do you do when they say, I finally found my true love right after leaving a relationship with you? Number one, however you need to do it, even repeating it over and over again, you got to remember this isn't about you. You were supply and then you weren't supply and they always get tired of supply. And that said, you're wondering, how am I supposed to survive this phase of their great new love story? The grandiosity makes for a short memory. They are reacting to what is in front of them, something new. They did the same with you. It's not personal, even though it feels deeply personal. This takes a minute. And so you need to, number two, be with the hurt. There will be grief in this process. You may think, oh, you know what? This fool isn't even worthy of my grief. It's not grief over them. It's grief that a process you cherished, loving another person, was wasted on a person who wasn't worthy of you, who was so shallow, who could be so ignorant of your feelings. All of that hurts. Be with that pain, therapy, self-compassion, trusted friends, other supports, all of that helps. But the only way out is through. And that means this is going to hurt. Number three, get the hell off of social media, please. It's so easy. Instagram is basically a glorified shopping mall these days. And Facebook is basically comprised as a conspiratorial rants of your unhinged friends and relatives. It's not good for you to see any of that. And the narcissistic person needs to broadcast their grandiose nonsense. I have no idea if a tree falls in the forest, whether it makes a sound if no one is there. I do know that if you don't have to see BS on social media, in a way it kind of isn't there and you can focus on your healing. I understand if you need social media for your business, that's fine. Then block or fool with the settings so you don't need to see brand new love story posts that hurt. Number four, if you have them, protect your children. If this is relevant, you got to do it. What does that mean? Clean up your kids' social media feed if they're old enough to be on social media. Be the one who brings consistency into their life because the flights of fancy and the new great love relationship for your ex means that your ex is now going to jet off to a tropical locale on the weekend of your children's school play or will flake on custody weekends or leave them unsupervised while they canoodle with their soulmate. Be present. Ensure that you have school and other significant events wired. Maintain their routines and ensure that if you're, if you're able to hopefully get the clearance to do so, if you're co-parenting, that your child has access to mental health services. The narcissistic parent may be insistent that the children love their new great love and children may struggle with this on multiple levels. Protect your children from the makeup, the makeout pictures, the bikini shots, the vacation shots, the muscle shots, and the other things that may make them uncomfortable. Is it fair that on top of all else, you're having to act as a sentry to protect children from the ex's inappropriate behavior? No, none of this is fair. But being present for your children and being consistent is everything, especially in the midst of this circus. Number five, the injustice piece is so tough. Intellectually, you know that this will end up being the narcissist's new great love story that ends, but it does still feel unjust. While you may be grieving a relationship and they are in Hawaii with their once in a lifetime love story, it hurts. Just like all pain, it's going to sting, it's going to hurt, so let it. The one advantage we have when it comes to heartbreak is time. The vast majority of folks start to right themselves with time and this too will pass with the added bonus that for narcissistic folks, all things bright will eventually fizzle. And that's going to happen with this too. Just don't get yourself get hoovered, right? Narcissistic folks live in a fantasy world. Fantasies of endless success, fame, 
fortune, and grandiose romantic love stories. It's why they often get married so many times. And even when they're getting married for the 10th time, they still have a big frothy white wedding with multiple wardrobe changes. They need the spectacle. So it's really about the spectacle, not the companionship, the consistency, the respect, the compassion, the mutuality of regard, the growth or the kindness. These are typically photoshopped relationships. Grieving a broken heart is the most human of experiences and one of the more painful ones. It is made more painful when the object of the broken heart is denying the experience you had. Your reality was different and you lost your reality in that relationship. It's painful to be reminded of that even in the aftermath. And then as you heal and are able to get more detached, there will come that moment when their greatest love story, love of my life, soulmate goes kaput. Grab some popcorn with some schadenfreude sprinkled on top and breathe into the predictability of these personalities and your resilience in the face of it. If nothing else, I hope this video is a validation for those of you going through this. It's real, it hurts, and nothing I or anyone else can say can change that. But also, it's a reminder that for narcissistic folks, my great new love is just code for a look, I got new supply. I cannot count how many times I have worked with people who are in a relationship with a narcissist and for a long time they bought the narcissist story that their their ex was absolutely insane and stalked them and harassed them and was obsessed with them and did all kinds of wacky stuff and because you were sort of into the narcissist you wanted to believe the narrative and you're like well i'm going to be the same new sexy person in this person's life no madness here time goes on Narcissistic abuse goes on, a little bit of love bombing, some discarding, a lot of gaslighting, and you're like, oh my God, I gotta get out of this. Or they discard you. But either way, the relationship ends. And I bet sometimes you wonder, what do they tell people? Now, you may hear about it. You may have enough flying monkeys that they've recruited or enough other people in your life watching them or even see it on social media. What narcissists are amazing at doing is always creating a revised and edited narrative that suits them. They do a few things in a relationship when it ends. Number one, they will say that they were the victim. They may even make up a story about you cheating or being shady or dodgy or doing something bad to them. So they can go into the world as a victim. Oh, you're not going to believe what my ex did. She cheated on me. And then the next person says, oh, I'd never cheat on you. And they play that victim card beautifully. Number two is the swagger. You know, like she was putting on weight. She was this, she was that. He was this, he was that. It's like, I grew out of that. Like they, they really seem like they're just too cool for school and they got out of that relationship. Number three is the smear campaign. In that case, the narcissist paints the ex as completely unhinged. They were stalking, they were obsessed, they were always accusing me of stuff, they were losing grip with reality. They gaslight you to the world in essence. They describe you as something you're not and you're not even there to defend yourself. They portray you as something that is absolutely untrue. That third scenario can be really unsettling because that puts you out in the world in a way you don't want to be perceived. Number one thing to keep in mind, whomever continues to spend time with your narcissist or hopefully ex-narcissist, do you really want to spend time with them? That means that they haven't figured out how difficult and damaged your narcissist is, so maybe they're just not smart enough to spend time with you. So choose your friends wisely. If they can't see it, step away from that. But that whole sense that the way they're going to describe a, a relationship that ended is always going to be in a way that makes them look good, whether as a person who was wronged, 
as a person who's just too good for it and most likely in a way that defames you and makes you look bad. If you honestly think a narcissist is gonna go and meet a new partner or talk to other people in the world and say, yeah, I wasn't a really good guy. I cheated on her and I lied to her and I psychologically abused her and that's why we're not together. Mm -mm. That's not gonna happen in this lifetime. So obviously that would certainly help you think, okay, that's great, they got some insight. But if they'd had insight, they would have had it with you, okay? So the way they describe the relationships that have gone out of their life will always make you look bad, will always make them look good, and will have no resemblance to reality. This can be particularly difficult when you see their little sob stories or weird stories or slanderous stories on social media. You know, those passive aggressive comments they write, don't you love when you manage to get out of a relationship that clipped your wings and now you can fly, fly high to the sky or something completely unhinged like that? You're thinking fly high to the sky, like what does that mean? They'll portray you as the sandbag that was sinking their dreams to others and that will often be framed against some bizarre sunset or two martinis on a bar. This is when you have to say, I dodged a bullet. Because if they were able to tell this story about our relationship after it ended, what were they saying while we were together? Narcissists are masters of manipulating the truth or frankly lying. In fact, there was a great line I recently heard, how do you know a narcissist is lying? Their lips are moving. And that's pretty much it. They lie a lot because it helps them protect that insecure core of theirs. They sell these dishonest stories about how their relationships end because it makes them feel better about themselves. So all of these things are being done to protect that fragile core ego interior of them. Once you get out, hard as it is, hard as it is to get them out of your head, hard as it is to wonder, will the next person get a better version? They're hearing these terrible stories about me. They're going to go off and have a happy future and laugh about me. Trust me, you'll be the one to get the last laugh. They will not move into a brighter future. The next person will suffer the same way you did. It's just a matter of time. So when you wonder what they're saying about your relationship when they move forward, the only thing you can be completely sure of is that what they're saying is a complete work of fiction. Hold on to your reality. You know what the true story of that relationship is. Do not, do not allow the narcissist to keep stealing your reality even after the relationship is done. One of the harder dynamics for people to get their head around about narcissistic people is how much they really do view other people really in essence as objects or as conveniences, which means that when that object of convenience is not behaving the way you want it to do, it becomes an inconvenience. But it goes a step beyond that because when they take advantage of other people, it's really that they determine something that this person can bring to them. It can be money, it could be connections, it could be experiences, it could be that they're very attractive and will make them look good to the world, whatever it is, they will sort of exploit that relationship for what it's worth and get what they can for it. What it can make you feel is kind of gross, as though you're not being seen as a person, but rather as an opportunity to leverage future opportunities. That idea of being taken advantage of is not a dynamic that's just restricted to interpersonal relationships. You can see it in close intimate, intimate relationships, I mean. You can ca you catch it in friends. You can catch it in the workplace. You can even catch it in family experiences where you'll see that one family member, let's say one family member succeeds, that a narcissistic member of that family will attempt to take advantage of that person's sort of standing experience, whatever, for their own advantage. In the most extreme of this, we'll sometimes see this when a family member maybe makes it big, becomes rich or famous or something like that, and another family member didn't fare as well, and that other family member is narcissistic. 
They may really try to go along for the ride, almost be a hanger on, or in the worst example, even cash in on them, turning in uncomfortable facts, um, uncomfortable family history, or really just sort of dropping a dime on them. There have been recent celebrity scandals where a family member actually was the person, it sounded like a very narcissistic family member, was the person who threw someone else in that family under the bus on the basis of that fa other family member's notoriety or something like that. So it can be really awful to see it play out in a family dynamic sort of setting. It can also feel horrifying if this is why somebody may be pursuing you. Now, a lot of, every, listen, all of us are sitting and saying, why well, ain't all that? What's there really to take advantage of? It's all relative. You may hold a higher position someplace than someone. In the grand scheme of things, you may have access to something they don't have. I don't know, a beach house, a better car, um, reservation someplace, tickets to a basketball game or something like that. That in wanting that thing or that experience from you, that they may actually then try to take advantage of that person to make that experience. There was actually a really interesting story news story that came out that was sort of at going just went on trial around the time we're making these videos and it, it involved a woman who was like a real sort of a grifter she would take advantage of people she sort of put herself out in the world as though she was some sort of like russian billionaire's daughter or, and, and had this whole mysterious backstory and in essence what she was doing was she was becoming friends with people and exploiting these connections that she claimed to have to get them to pay for stuff that ended up culminating in her becoming friends with a woman who ended up fronting up something like $60,000 for nights out and a big vacation and all of that. And interestingly, that case went to trial. The woman was found guilty, but even throughout the trial, this woman was making a big show of wearing specific kinds of outfits and sort of trying to still look dazzling in the courtroom, as it were. So that's a real example of somebody who was taking advantage of people by telling a story about themselves, twisting the reality, so they could get what they want from another person who didn't even have it to give. You see this in corporate settings all the time, when somebody walks into a situation or business settings, and they see that there's a weakness they can exploit, and they take advantage of it. This happened on massive levels, if you want to argue it that way, in the mortgage, um, the mortgage banking crash that led to the recession of 2008, where a handful of people took advantage of a system and exploited it and ended up really taking advantage of the naivete of borrowers. So taking advantage of a weakness or a person for your own gain is something that can happen at a massive level, at the global economic level, or at an individual level. But what narcissists, particularly malignant narcissists, and obviously psychopaths are really good at doing, is finding out a person's weakness or recognizing that somebody has what they want and exploiting any weakness in that situation to get what they want out of that situation for their own gain. When you've been through that on the receiving end, it's horrible. You feel very victimized, it can feel quite traumatic, and in some cases it can actually be quite tragic. You may lose a lot of money, you may lose a reputation, you may lose status, and there may not even be a way to get legal reparations. For example, you may never get that money back. So being taken advantage of in that way doesn't feel good, whether it's an intimate partner, a business associate, a family member. It almost always feels exploitative and it can even feel traumatic. If you're going through it, sometimes the best you can do is try to get the best reparation you can in this kind of a situation. And sometimes you can't, so you really have to go to a place of radical acceptance and say, okay, shame on me. Hopefully next time I learn. But after those experiences, it can be really, really hard to learn to trust after someone takes advantage of you in such an extreme way. So have any of you had this situation that sometimes and I'm telling you that sometimes, but have you ever find yourself that just as you were getting happy, like your life was really going well again, that's when they hoover you? Well, what we're going to talk about today, this idea that sometimes they hoover you because they don't want you to be happy. Okay, so let's sort of lay it out this way. So your nar let's say your narcissistic relationship ends, right? Maybe you ended it, maybe they ended it, maybe it ended badly, the kind of thing where they cheated or betrayed you in some way. Whatever it may be, the narcissistic relationship ends. And that's never easy because it's so confusing. 
You may grieve. You may mourn. You may feel devastated, even though you know it's good for you. You ruminate. You obsess. You look at their social media, if they have it. You might go through a period where you can't sleep or you lose weight because you can't eat. You go into therapy, maybe. Maybe you go into a certain Dr. Romney's healing program. And as always, that link is available in the video notes. But you do what you can to heal from this, right? But you do the work. Time passes. And honestly, when it comes to healing from narcissistic abuse, time may be your greatest friend. You start to feel better. Then you start to feel really better. Maybe work starts going better. Maybe you meet someone or you travel, or you do other things that you've always wanted to do. You slowly take your life back, and you really recognize that your life is so much better without the narcissistic person in it. It took you a while, and you're getting closer and closer to indifference, to not caring about what has happened to them or what they're doing. You may not even wish them ill will, but you just don't care about them anymore. You really are in what I consider to be the zone of healing. And then one day, you see a message from them. Maybe you block them, but they use a new number. Maybe you didn't block them. Maybe it's an email that gets through. It's a lot harder to block email. But you're resolute. However, they try to break you down. It's as though they've made a list of every single thing you ever had wanted to hear from them. That they are sorry that now they finally see that your your gifts and your goodness, that they weren't worthy of you, that they knew you would be better off without them and they play the victim. Who knows? Whatever it is, they just keep going. But you're the new improved you right now, right? You're more healed. You feel resolute and even believe that you've now evolved. And you might start making that mistake of like, well, I'm healed. We could be friends, right? That's what modern healthy people do. You might even respond to their messages. You might even give them some advice because they're going through a tough time. And maybe you even agree to meet. And that means checkmate. And now it's their game again. The tricky thing about life post-narcissist is to not advertise your growth and healing too much which I know is not easy in a social media world. If you are still struggling and crying into your coffee and sharing your misery, eh, the narcissistic person isn't that interested in you. They've already done. They've already overwhelmed you, and they're done with you. They're on to their next thing. And as long as you're miserable, they don't care. Like, they've already ruined you. But if you share your growth, you and having a happy new relationship, you traveling the world, you thriving, now... You're happy and you're tempting. They may hoover you to show you that they can still dominate you or that they can still win or maybe they're just sadistic and they don't want you to be happy. I actually believe that for narcissistic people, other people's happiness disgusts them. But you want to share your joy with the world and I get that. And I think it's wonderful, but it's dangerous. It's almost like using your real identity while you are in the witness protection program, right? It's dangerous. It's unfortunate, but it's true. Because if they see, they see that you're happy, nah, you become someone to dominate again, to harm again. So what do you do? Number one, keep in mind that indifference and detachment are just that. Do not engage is not a short-term strategy. It is a forever strategy. The more severe the narcissistic abuse, the greater the importance that you should never engage with them again. If they send you a cryptic message from a new phone, old phone, any phone, block again, or at the very least, ignore it. The same with DMs and emails. If you can't stop that, if you can't do enough blocking, then no backing and forthing. But if you do respond, that means you're in play. And then it becomes more of a game for them. It's like you're a live bite on a a fishing line. You need to be at the most advanced levels of healing to not engage. Now, also keep in mind, if you are in a new relationship, well, that could be a little bit of a protection or a hedge because you don't want to hurt the new person by engaging with a harmful person from your past. At least I hope you don't. But that new person, having that new person in your life, well, lead them to try even harder. And I'll say more about that in a minute. The narcissistic person may even see that they're in danger. They're in danger. Call 911 and send an ambulance to their house. But do not engage. 
Number two, if you are in a new relationship, well, fact is that is game on for a narcissistic person because now there is someone to take you away from and they love that kind of fight. Think of how, and just take a minute, think of how you would feel if your new partner started interacting with a narcissistic and manipulative ex. My guess is not good, so don't you do it either. It becomes a major cat and mouse game between you and the ex-narcissist in your life. And the idea that you have someone new in your life gets their juices going. Keep your new relationship under wraps. And even just to be empathic to your new partner, do not respond, block even if it's multiple numbers being blocked, and do not engage. Do not engage. <coughs> Number three, if you, aren't, if you aren't all the way indifferent and still feel you would respond to the narcissist, then if you can find a way, don't put your life on social media. Because if even one person from your life has a connection to the narcissistic person, even if your account settings are in private, even if you've blocked the ex-narcissist, your success and happiness become something for them to dismantle. And narcissistic folks are masterful at recruiting flying monkeys and spies. I know people love sharing their lives on social media, but if you are in the acute stages of healing and it was a more severe narcissistic relationship, keep your, quiet, your healing quiet for now. Number four, really, really ask your friends to never share how your life is going with the ex-narcissistic person. I know that can feel a little bossy, but some people, especially enabling people, just don't get this. Now, the fact is, this is not something you can really enforce, but you can certainly try to remind them. And if you are a friend of someone, don't think you are doing them any favors by rolling up to the ex-narcissist in their life if you see them out and about and saying, hey, your ex is doing great and has a new life and a new thing and a new that. That may not end up being an issue, but it could also just aggravate or incite the narcissist enough to make them want to reach in and make a mess of things in a new life you've made. And number five, no, it won't be different this time. Just because you feel better about yourself and are doing things you love, that doesn't mean they change. They don't change. I don't have enough days in the week to list all of the people out there who have told me that they were actually at the top of their game when they originally met the narcissist who is in their life. And the narcissistic person dismantled them brick by brick. Always remember what was done to you. And maybe right now you're healed and you're single or healing and single. You're feeling good about your life. And then the narcissist wanders back in. I promise you, if you let them back in, that same dismantling process will happen again. It's what they do. Scorpion is going to sting. Narcissistic people are allergic to other people's happiness. It's really that simple. And especially the happiness of people who they have already controlled and dominated. So if you want to share it, then make sure your gates are tall and high so the narcissist can't come back in and do any more harm. They don't change. That's the nature of this personality and the thing that gives them joy. Control, domination, power, those things still give them joy. And that usually means harming you. For this reason, journaling is so important. You need to read all of the terrible stuff that ha happened in this relationship because you journaled it in real time. And also to journal your healing so you can see how hard the work was of grief and of healing. Read all of that, see all of that before you ever let them in again. Thanks again.